good to be here. But by the way, where's, where, where'd Mike go? We just sang the song. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it doing that. Listen, I haven't heard that song in a few years, but that is as good as I've, I've heard anybody else sing it. That was phenomenal. That is a great song. I didn't, I didn't recognize it at first, and then when you hit that, the chorus, the midnight cry, that was, that was cool. I enjoyed that. So I, I'm on, right? I had to make sure that this mic was nowhere near me when I was back there. <laughs> nowhere near. There would be far fewer people here if that thing was on. Um, I actually did when I, was, when I was younger, when I was in my mid-20s. Somehow I accidentally got put on the praise and worship singing team at the church that I was going to. I don't think they turned the mic on for me. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but it wasn't, it wasn't great <laughs> when I would sing. So, First, so before I get going, I, I want to say a huge thank you to Pastor Randy uh, for allowing uh, me to minister to you, the, the congregation um, it's all, and I, I was talking to Pastor Andy yesterday, we came up here, and uh, I, was, I was telling you, I said, listen, it's always an honor to get invited to a church to minister. It's always an honor, right? Because they, they, they trust you enough to come and minister, and you're not going to come up and start saying some crazy stuff that's not in the Bible, right? You, you know, it's, it's an honor. But you know what's a bigger honor? When they invite you back <laughs> a second time. So it, it's a huge honor, um, it's a true honor. So I just want you to know we don't, we don't take that fact lightly at all. Sarah, would you stand up? This is my... <laughs> she doesn't like it when I tell her to stand up. This is my beautiful wife, Sarah. Yes, folks, I am that blessed. That is my wife, yep. So, <laughs> so we are out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, by way of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, by way of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, so so we're, we are traveling our itinerant ministers out of Fayetteville, and we go to church as a minister, we do events, we did a men's conference back in October, we're actually doing a leadership and a men's conference in Tulsa uh, next month. It's hard to believe we're about at the end of January. I'm not sure what happened to January, but, we, but we're doing a conference then. We also go to other countries, as alluded to, we do missions work. Uh, last time we were here, Sarah was getting ready to go to Peru, and now she's been to Peru. She was there for 10 days. She was in Lima, she took planes, she took car, 12, 14-hour car rides, just bouncing around. She does it better than I do, but when she bounces around like in a car for 12 to 14 hours, they baptized in, in a tributary of the Amazon River in the jungle. It was a lot of outreach to folks that have rarely or have never had the gospel of Jesus Christ ministered to them. She was there for 10 days. Uh, it took a few days when she came back for her not to be mad because it's an interesting thing when you go to another country, you go, out in the, you go out into the jungle, and you go to people who are just so hungry for God. And I don't know if you know this or not, but, but some of us in Western culture, we might be a little tiny bit spoiled. Anybody spoiled in here? I'm a little spoiled. We get a little spoiled, right? Well, these folks would walk for miles and miles just to come to church. And I don't mean on Sunday, every day to come to receive from God, to come receive of the Holy Spirit. So it was just, it was a great experience. It was a great time. And we're actually getting ready. So we are planning a trip to Cuba. We were planning a trip to Cuba. We are now going to Cuba in either April or May. Where the details are getting finalized, but we're going down there. Uh, we actually met with a pastor that we're going with out of Kentucky this past week. There's going to be some awesome things going on. There's a, there's a church that formed I don't know how I can explain this. We just learned about this. There's a, there was a dump in an area of Cuba that's very poor. And there, the idea was that these folks went in and they were going to minister to a few people who kind of lived at the dump. Maybe give them, you know, help them, give them some food, some, you know, some local currency or whatever, some money. And they wound up getting surrounded by hundreds of men and women who were living at the dump in Cuba. So what's happening is, is they are working on building a facility for folks to actually come to, to come eat, to come get ministered to, away from the dump, not at the actual dump. So it's just some wonderful things going on. We, uh, we're planning a trip soon to Norway and Sweden. In July, I believe we are going to Greenland. We're going to help uh, start a Bible school in Greenland, but it's kind of that spy out the land part of it. Um, where else are we going? I, I know I'm forgetting something. Um, Anywhere else we were going? Yeah, me neither. We're going lots of places. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is, I can't believe I forgot this. The coolest thing. Okay, in May. Okay, I'm a little excited about this one. Can you tell? The, the coffee just kicked in. So 
How many of you have ever watched professional wrestling when you were younger or you still watch it now? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hand when I say it like real high. Okay. So I grew up on professional wrestling. I used to love the NWA, WCW, all the, and then I, I like the WWF too and all that. So not so much the current stuff, but we got, we have a uh, independent wrestling company that does fake, it's fake wrestling, fake wrestling, uh, choreographed and everything. And they have the, the good guys and the bad guys, the faces and the heels, right? They have all that. But the, uh, the guy who runs it and several of the wrestlers are Christians. So we are doing an outreach for the Choctaw Indian Nation down in Southeast Oklahoma, where we're going to have a wrestling event. We're going to have food, right? We're, I don't know what kind of food, hot dogs, all kinds of stuff for the family, big family event. But here's the secret that I haven't told those folks yet. We're going to preach the gospel to them. We're going to get them all in, and then we're going to preach Jesus to them, and we're going to, we're going to try to get as many folks saved as possible. So that's in May. Um, so uh, with that being said, if you guys think about this, if this comes up in your heart at all, please pray for us, because this is kind of a, I think it's going to be a pretty big undertaking. I've never put on a wrestling event before. I'm assuming it's hard, but in any, I'm not the one choreographing any, any events, though. I'm, like, doing all the other stuff. But uh, if you think about it, pray for us. Um, and then also, uh, and, and with permission, of course, if, if this is something you would like to donate to, you can see Sarah and I after the service. If it's something on your heart and God moves in your heart, that I'd like to support that. See us. Um, we can give you a tax-deductible receipt as well because so, we have a ministry that's a nonprofit organization, so it's completely tax-deductible. Um, but we, we would love to as well. Again, with permission too, I always ask, you don't, you don't try to raise money at a church without asking. It's just not a good idea. That's why I keep getting asked back to places because I don't do stupid things. So um, now listen, I don't want to keep you guys until 2 p.m. I don't think that would be good. After all, blessed are the short-winded for they will be invited back again. Like I'm going for a third time. We'll see how this goes. All right. Um, that was such an amazing meal this morning. Anybody still full? I thought about saying how good... Uh, I, the first thing I started eating was the biscuits and gravy, and I thought, oh, wow, these biscuits and gravy are amazing. I don't know who made them, but I need to call those out. Then I started eating the eggs and the hash browns. I went, oh, man, the eggs and the hash browns are amazing. I started eating the bacon and, and the breakfast meat and the grits, and then I realized, listen, it was all good. It was, there was not a bad thing anywhere. It'll, no, Thank you so much. And for those of you who didn't come, listen... Oh, I'm sorry. You missed out. You really, you really missed out. So I was going to do the joke that my message this morning is on gluttony, but then I thought that would be very hypocritical of me. You didn't see my plate this morning. It was, it was good. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Let's kind of get serious a little bit. Let's bow our heads in prayer, if you guys don't mind. Oh, Father, we thank you. Father God, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, Father, just as Paul prayed over the church at Ephesus, I ask you to give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Holy Spirit, I ask that you have your way in this place today with the message in our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I heard a little bit of the Sunday school message this morning. So apparently, I am on the right track with the message this morning. So today is Baptist Men's Day, right? Today is Baptist Men's Day. So it's, um, this morning's message is so important for men to understand. It really is. Um, it's about who we are in, relation to, or in relationship to God, our Father. Um, I believe this message will actually help us, and I saw it earlier. Well, it still has my name up there, so I kind of wrote it down. Rise up, O men of God, and lead. It's so interesting. Men have such an interesting place in the family, uh, in the church, in the ecclesia, the church, the body of Christ. We are called to be leaders. We're called to be the spiritual leaders of our home. But I tell you what, there is no other entity on this planet that's under greater attack than men, right? It, it's tough to be a, a, a man nowadays. It's tough to be a godly Christian man nowadays. Now, the secret kind of, though, is this. This is Baptist Men's Day. This message is not exclusively for men. This is actually, um, it's for men, women, for young and old, and for all points in between, right? Not all points in between men and women. That's, I, it's safe to say there's only man and woman, right? There's not 74 other genders or anything. I can say that here, right? Yeah. 
Okay, we're all on the same page for that? Okay, good. Praise God. Now, one thing you should know, and I did mention this last time I was here, but I always try to bring this up. I, this is my Bible, right? I believe that the words in here are God's word. I believe this is God's word. Now, man penned it, right, or so to speak. They wrote it, but I believe that it was through the Holy Spirit that's God-inspired. And, and when the word of God, when the Bible says something, I take it as fact. One of my favorite statements I've ever heard, and I've kind of adopted it for my own, is that God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. So I want you to know, as I minister this morning, it is 100% focused on the fact that God's word is true. If it says it in the Bible, I believe it. It's, a, it's the truth. It's a fact, right? Regardless of experiences, regardless of what I've heard before, all that pales in comparison to what's in the Bible. The Bible says that let God be true and every man a liar, Right? So I just want you to know that that's the mindset that I go in whenever I minister, but I want you guys to know that this morning. Now, if you were here in August, you might recall that I told, I told a little story about the little boy with the baseball, right? Do you guys remember that story? Anybody not know what I'm talking about? Because I'm going to do the story anyways. I just want to know how fast I can go. <laughs> so there was a little boy, and he was about six or seven years old, had a healthy self-esteem. So he walks outside in his front yard, and he's got a baseball bat and a baseball, and he kind of says... He says to himself, he looks around, I am the greatest baseball player ever. Takes the ball, throws it up in the air, takes a swing, misses it, hits the ground. Picks it up and says, looks around, see if anyone saw him miss, miss the ball. He said, I am the greatest hitter in baseball ever. Takes that ball and he throws it up. He takes a swing, hits the ground again. Picks up that ball. And he looks around, and he's like, I am not about to strike out. I am the greatest hitter in baseball ever. Steps back, kind of gets his foot back. Like, I never really played baseball, but I think you're supposed to put your back foot back. Anybody play baseball? Okay, yeah, so nobody can correct me. Sweet. So you take the ball. He took the ball. He throws it up, and he swings way back, and he's like, and he hits the ground. He picks it up. Shoulders kind of slump, and he says to himself, I am the greatest pitcher in baseball. <laughs> I love that story. It goes to so many different things. But listen, what I, what I want to do is I want you to... I, the message this morning is about getting you to change your position or adjust your position of how you see yourself with our Heavenly Father, with God. This whole message should be about seeing yourself the way God sees you and God's relationship with you. I know we, our, almost our whole world is about our relationship with God, but how many of you know we wouldn't have a relationship with God unless he established a relationship with us? The reason we love him is because he first loved us, right? All right. Now, the title for this morning's message is, God is for us, God is with us, and God is in us. Now, most of us as Christians, right, as believers in Christ, uh, we know and believe, right, that God is with us, right? Most of us, we know, that, we know that God is with us wherever we go, right? If you have your Bibles this morning, how many of you guys have your Bibles this morning, whether it's a paper or a, some people have electronic, I got both, I'm kind of cheating. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, if you would turn over to Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 13. How many of you know the Bible uh, actually commands the husband to make coffee in the morning for their wives? Book of Hebrews. Anyone? Feel free. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13. I love, see, I love corny jokes, dad jokes. I love them. And you are welcome to steal them, if, by the way, if you, if you like one. That one probably wasn't one you'd want to steal. But... Hebrews chapter 13, and I'm, a, I'm going to be reading mostly out of the New King James this morning. So it's very much like the King James, if that's what you're used to, but there's no these, thous, ye, etc., right? Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, it's interesting. These verses in Hebrews are referring back to uh, an Old Testament reference over in Deuteronomy 
chapter 31. So why don't you go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy 31. I, I don't plan to have you guys flip to a lot of scriptures this morning, but I may as well. I, like I said, I'm very much focused on what's in the Word of God. So Deuteronomy chapter 31. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. If, those of you who have Bibles with the little references, with the little letters, and then it has the little scriptures in the middle, I highly recommend following those sometimes. If you ever want to enhance your your study of the Bible or your understanding of the Bible, you can find some phenomenal truths, some, some, some light on some scripture, sometimes that we don't understand until we look at the scripture in light of other scriptures. So Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 through 8. Here, a couple more pages turning. Hebrews 31, verses 6 through 8. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And now listen, the background of this scripture is Moses is actually getting ready to die. And Joshua is going to be the one leading the Israelites into the promised land and into some pretty epic battles, right? If you read through the book of Joshua. But Moses was basically announcing the fact he was going to be leaving the people soon. And Moses is relaying God's message to Joshua in the hearing of the Israelites, so they would hear as well, regarding God going with them into the promised land. Even though, and it was kind of an assurance to both Joshua and the Israelites because they were going into the promised land without Moses. Moses was their 100% interface with God. The God who redeemed them from Egypt, who brought them out of Egypt, who you know, caused the Red Sea to part, the the, you know, all these things that were happening, the cloud by day, the pillar by night, all these miracles and even some of the judgments that took place, Moses was their interface and now Moses is leaving. So how many of you know there needed to be some reassurance? They needed something to build their confidence. And God spoke through Moses saying, I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. He was going with them. And listen, just like the Israelites, right, who went into the promised land, they fought, they beat various armies and nations, he goes with you and I as well, right? Under, this new test, under the New Testament or the new covenant that we're under, God goes with us as well, just like we read in Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews, which some people believe it was Paul, we don't, I, we don't actually know who wrote Hebrews, right? There's some argument whether it was Paul, I've heard others as well, but the writer of Hebrews is actually saying that, is, is reminding us that he is with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And then in verse 6, so that you and I may boldly say I will, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that the Lord is my, sh- the Lord, sorry, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. So we know God is with us, right? Thank God we know God is with us. So part one was God with us, right? That's the first part of the message. Now, I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 8. Back over into the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. You may notice this morning I'm, I'm going to enunciate the books of the Bible. The other night I sent folks to the complete wrong book of the Bible, went on for about seven minutes with these confused looks on people's faces. It was a little funny. The best part was, do you know who called me out on it in front of the whole congregation? That woman right there. She just yells out, what book? It was great. I'm like, what do you mean what book? All right, Romans chapter 8, verses uh, 31 and 32. It's good to know we're fallible, isn't it? It really is. It's good to know we're fallible. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, I love this verse, right? This verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
That verse alone is a sermon in and of itself. That is, that is its own sermon in and of itself. If we keep reading, right, the next few verses talk about how nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ. Praise God. But in verse 31, Paul is telling us that if God is for us, who can be against us, right? If God is for you, who can be against you, right? Can sickness be against you? If God is for you, can sickness be against you? Gets a little quiet when you say things like that, right? But when you put it in perspective, if God is for you, who can be against you? Can depression be against you? We can experience depression, right? But if God is for you, can depression be against you? That's a good question. I want you guys to ponder that. We got a little quiet there when I said that. Listen, if God is for you, can the devil be against you? We know that he is, but we know in John 10.10, 10, it says that the thief, the devil, has come to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. So if something is in your life or you've seen something in your family's life, as, as men, if we see something in our family's life that we'd see that, it can, that it's trying to steal from us, it's trying to kill us, and it's trying to destroy us, it's from the thief, it's from the devil. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. All right, now let's go back to the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Now, just as you're turning over there, just a little bit of background. The Israelites had just received the report, right, from the 12 spies that God had Moses sent into the promised land. This was before the 40 years in the wilderness. He sent the 12 spies, 10 of the spies, right? We know the story brought back an evil report filled with unbelief. We can't take the land. They're too big. We're too small. Yes, the land is great, exactly as God said, but we can't do it. Two of the spies, though, Joshua and Caleb, came back with a positive report. They said, oh, it is a great land and we are well able, right? We don't rebel against the Lord. We are well able. Now, in Numbers 14, we see Joshua and Caleb responding to the people who were so fearful based upon what the ten had come back and said. Numbers chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people in the land, for they are our bread, their protection is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, do not fear them. Doesn't that just speak to the fact that if God was for them, who could be against them? If God was for us, and if God is for us, who can be against us? We see God was with his people, and God was for his people, right, from those scriptures that we've read. And we know, we know what happened, Joshua and the Israelites, right, they went into the promised land, conquering, taking the land just to, as God had promised eventually, right, after the 40 years, after the, the, the first generation died out, the only two people who went into that land from that first generation was who? Joshua and Caleb were the only two that went in there. Man, they had to bury a lot of people, didn't they? But they wholly followed the Lord, and they got to go. And even Moses, Moses disobeyed God. Remember the second time when he, when he struck the rock, when God told him to speak to the rock? And he wound up not going in either. Matter of fact, he kept asking God. God said, stop asking me about this. You can look, but you are not going, right? Joshua and Caleb were the only two that got to go. And listen, the whole time they were fighting with these lands, these more established armies, these larger armies, these great masses of people. And remember, these were not people, these weren't warriors. This wasn't an army that came out. I mean, it was a large group of people, but this wasn't an army that came out of Egypt. These were slaves for 400 years. They came out and defeated armies that were greater, better trained, better weapons, but God was for them. And listen, we can be confident knowing that we as God's people now, that he is for us as well. And I'll take an amen on that one. Amen. I'll take, I don't normally ask a whole lot of amens, but I'll take one on that one. God is for us now. 
Amen. Amen. But now, here is what I was really excited to get into this morning. The main aspect of our relationship with God I wanted to get into. Listen, under the, uh, in the Old Testament, I'm going to sneak some water here before I go too much farther, before I get too excited. You can't have spit fly if you don't have any. I'm just kidding. <laughs> under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, right, God was with his people and God was for his people. We saw some examples of that. And we know that God is with us and for us now. But you know what he wasn't? God was not in his people in the Old Testament. He was not in him, in them. Today, God is for us and with us, but his home is in us. Now, I'm going to tell tell you guys a little story. So back when I was uh, my second year in Bible school, I was, at the time I was 22, so I had the maturity of about a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old. But I was in Bible school. I had a little Nissan pickup truck. Do you guys remember those little Nissan pickup trucks? They had little stick shifts. They were quick little suckers. Great gas mileage. I think it got all of 20 miles per gallon. But in any event, I was in my second year of Bible school, and I was driving down a, a country road in Broken Arrow. This was before that whole town had grown quite a bit. There was a whole lot of country roads. And I'm going down this long straightaway. It was probably 35 mile an hour zone. I think I just, and I don't even know why. I, I got this idea that instead of going the 35 or 40, I'm going to go 70. It's nighttime. It's like 9 or 9.30 at night. There's no people out. It's a country road, right? It's kind of fun to kind of open it up a little bit. So let me back up a little bit. About two weeks before, now we're talking 1997, 1998, well, early 1998. You didn't have to wear seatbelts back then. Certain states were starting to get seatbelt laws, right? Oklahoma was not one of them yet. Arizona wasn't one of them yet. I didn't wear a seatbelt. I never wore a seatbelt. I grew up You know, seatbelts were fun to play with on long road trips. You didn't wear the seatbelt, right? So about two weeks before this was occurring, I suddenly, out of nowhere, I suddenly felt physically uncomfortable not wearing a seatbelt. Like, it was almost unexplainable. I couldn't start the car. I felt physically uneasy to to a point like I could not start the car unless I put my seatbelt on. And this went on for about two weeks. I I didn't think a whole lot of it other than, well, maybe I'm just supposed to start wearing my seatbelt. I didn't think anything of it. So like I mentioned, back to two weeks later, I'm driving 70 miles an hour down this this little country road. As a 22-year-old, I can't say I paid a lot of good attention to details, but I did pay attention to this one as I was passing the stop sign and the T in the road as I'm going into an embankment head-on at 70 miles an hour in a little tiny Nissan pickup truck. I hit that, I did hit the brakes, I went from like 70 to 68, maybe. I went to zero all of a sudden, though, I'll tell you that. I hit that embankment full on by myself, and that seatbelt held. Praise God, that seatbelt held. Now, why am I telling you this story? God was in me. The Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of me. I believe strongly that that was a warning two weeks before to get me to start wearing my seatbelt, because I can promise you as fast as I was going... And that truck, what happened to that truck, we wouldn't be talking right now. I, I would be in the presence of Jesus right now. I really would be. The Holy Spirit is in us. And that's why I wanted to tell you that story. I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I also tell that story, if you don't wear your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt. <laughs> this public service announcement paid for by no one. I'm just kidding. First Corinthians chapter three. I said no one because I don't know what the South Carolina Department of Public Safety is called. So, anyway, uh, First Corinthians chapter three, verse sixteen. I love this verse too. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So God in the person. Notice, God in the person of the Holy Spirit, notice I didn't call the Holy Spirit an it, I called him a he, a person of the Holy Spirit, he lives inside of you and me. Now a few chapters later over in chapter 6, if you guys want to flip a couple pages over, in 1 Corinthians 6, again, same letter to the church at Corinth, right, Paul is writing the same letter, 
Paul didn't write the book of 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians or any of the other books in chapter and verse, right? He wrote it in letter form. The, the translators put the chapters and the verses in there, but this is, these are continuations of thoughts. Uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Amen? Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against, against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now listen, sometimes us and we in Western culture, we don't quite understand the concept of a temple, right? But Paul very much understood what, what the temple meant. And for the Jewish people, the temple was a place where the literal presence of God was shut up within. within. Nobody, not anyone could just go into the Holy of Holies and like go say, hey God, how's it going? Only the high priest at certain times of the year, right? And he better be right with God or else they were going to have a help wanted sign for a new high priest, right? If he wasn't right with God, they used to tie the little things around their ankles. The, uh, and it had like bones and different stuff to make noise because you were constantly doing work in there. You were moving around. If that stopped moving, pull the guy out, put up the help wanted sign, put up the ad on indeed.com or whatever they did back then. They didn't have indeed.com back then, by the way. But they would need a new high priest, right? People could not just walk into there. But now as a believer in Christ, right? As a born-again believer in Christ, the presence of God, God's Holy Spirit, lives on the inside of us. And that's something I really want to get across to you today. The, whole, the Holy Spirit of God, that same power that people couldn't just walk in and be around, is inside of you. That same power. And listen, thanks to the blood of Jesus Christ, when the Spirit of God, the presence of God, comes to live on the inside of us, we're not destroyed. Because the blood of Jesus, right, has made us righteous, has made us new wineskins, if you will, as Jesus called it. So let's turn just a few pages over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 14 through 16. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16 says... Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? I want you to notice something. You and I as believers are called righteousness and light. We are called righteousness. Do you guys know what righteousness means? Right standing with God. When God looks at us in Christ under the blood of Jesus, do you know what he sees? Somebody who's, who's never sinned, right standing with God. That's the, if you go to the Greek meaning of righteousness, we, are, we have right standing with God. Amen? Amen? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, you see, Paul here is referencing back to the Old Testament. He's saying, listen, I will dwell in them, right? He's telling his people, prophetically speaking, that I'm going to be walking in them. I will dwell in them and walk among them. Listen, if you are a Christian, if you are born again, you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received Jesus Christ, if you are saved, right, then the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Now, there are so many truths in the New Testament that, that talk about, you know, what that truth means, right? The truth that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. But this morning, I want to focus on a couple of key points. Now, 
I want you to turn over to Isaiah 119. Now, this is going to be something that I think is, I think it'll set a few people free because I, I love, there's, there's something between the Old and the New Testament sometimes that we miss. Isaiah 119, and I can quote this one because I've heard this one so many times in uh, the, the circles uh, Sarah and I kind of operate in a lot, the churches and stuff. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I've heard so many people, like I've said, reference this scripture. Basically, it's saying, if you will obey God, you will obey his word, right? And you will do it willingly. You'll want to, right? You will eat the good of the land. In other words, you'll be blessed, right? If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. He wants, he does, God doesn't just want us obeying him. He wants us to want to obey him, right? Walking in love forgiveness, abstaining from sinful behaviors. How about obeying a call of God on your life? Whatever that may be. If you feel like you have a call of God in your life, how about following that? God the Father doesn't just want us to obey Him. He wants us to want to obey Him. And listen, there's some things that are very easy for us to want to obey, right? I mean, walking in love with with other people, right? I I bet every single one of us in this room absolutely want to walk in love with everybody in our lives that we can, right? I don't think anyone would be like, nah, I don't don't want to do that. But how many of you know it's not always easy to do that? Anybody have anyone in your life that's a little difficult to love? If they're sitting next to you, do not raise your hand. (laughs) I'm kidding, of course, but we all have people in our lives, right? Whether they're family, neighbors, uh, there's, there, there's always a challenge to us walking in love. It's not always easy to do, but it's easy to want to, right? We want to love people. How about forgiving other people? Forgiving other people. Listen, that is something we all, for the most part, want to do, right? We want to walk in forgiveness for other, in others. But listen, and I'm just going to be real with you, there's some folks who have suffered some things in their lives at the hands of other people that can make it very hard to forgive someone, right? It can make it very difficult. We've, all, we've known people who've had stuff happen. We've known, maybe we're the ones who've had stuff happen to them. But you, did you know, we want to forgive, but God commands us to forgive others. Jesus himself said, forgive so that you'll be forgiven. Do you guys remember the story of, of, the, of the wicked servant, the one that the, the, his, uh, he owed a bunch of money to, to the guy, and the guy said, I forgive you. He had compassion on forgiveness. Then he goes out, and what do he do? Goes out and finds a friend of his that owed him like a few dollars. Took him by the neck, said, give me the money you owe me, and then had him thrown in prison until he could pay it back. God doesn't just say, hey, it's a good idea for us to forgive others. It's a strong suggestion. It'd be really good for you if you forgave. No, it's a commandment. We're told to forgive. There's a lot of folks out there. I say a lot of folks. There are folks out there who have so much unforgiveness in their heart, it affects them physically. People people have things that affect them physically. You know, I know it's an it's an old kind of cliche, but you know, it's it's interesting. If somebody does something to you and you hold unforgiveness against them, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to be affected by it. It really is true. Because it's not up to us to make somebody come to us and ask for forgiveness and to tell us that they're they're sorry. That's between them and God. Your only job is to forgive them. And it is so important to forgive. It is so important. I could keep talking about that on and on. Let's talk about a fun one. How about paying your tithes? Everyone love paying tithes? Everyone love, I mean, love paying tithes? Listen, I know, Brother Howard, don't talk about finances in the church. You're not supposed to talk about finances. Listen, it is true. Though. Think about tithing, right? We're commanded to tithe, bring the 10% right to the, to the storehouse, right? And there's promises with it. How many of you know there's some people who want to do it, but they don't feel like they can, but there's some people who just don't want to do it. They just do not want to do it. I've known folks who are like, I don't want to do it, bless God. And it's like, fine, then don't do it. But God instructs us to do that, right? I hope you all can kind of appreciate me being a little bit real this morning, a little bit, little bit of realness. 
Now, I want you to keep in mind what we read in Isaiah 119. It's in the Old Testament, right? It's under the Old Covenant. Now, remember, under, in, under the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament, God was with his people and God was for his people, but, but he was not in his people. So with that in mind, turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 13. Now, if you'll pay attention here, this will really bless you. Remember, Isaiah 119 said, if you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You'll be blessed. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. For it is God who works in you both to what? To will, to want to, right? To will or to want to, and to actually do for his good pleasure. Do you guys see that? With God as the person of the Holy Spirit in you, you can rely on him to work in you and to help you to, to, to will and to want to and to actually do things like forgiving others. You can rely on him to abstaining from sinful behaviors, obeying the call of God in your life. You can rely on him to help you tithe. Yes, actually tithe. Whenever you read something in the Bible that seems difficult, or you, or you hear a sermon that challenges you to do something that seems hard to do, or something that seems hard to even want to do, or let's just be honest, sometimes there's things we do not want to do, it, period. It's not that it's hard to want to do, we don't want to do it. There are some things we don't want to do, but you can look to the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you to work in you, to literally work in you, to will and to do for his good pleasure. Amen? Amen. All right, okay. So God is in you. His Holy Spirit is on the inside of you as a born-again believer in Christ. So one final point this morning. 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Let me get there in a second here. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess, does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This is something I really want you to remember. As a born-again believer, as a child of the Most High God, the greater one lives on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit. Greater than that Antichrist spirit that's in the world. Listen, John said this almost around 2,000 years ago, right? And he said that the Antichrist spirit was already in the world then. Now, I think I'm pretty sure if you turn on CNN or you turn on MSNBC or Fox News or whatever you watch or get on social media, watch YouTube, drive down the street, the Antichrist spirit is very much alive and well in the earth, right? You know it's an operation today. But, and this is the truth, the Bible says that you have overcome them, all of those things, because greater is he, the Holy Spirit of God, who is, lives in you, than that Antichrist spirit that's in the world. Well, you might say, listen, Brother Howard, I appreciate that, but I really don't feel like much of an overcomer. I believe that so many, it's because so many Christians, we don't, we don't know that truth. 
We don't know it. Um, let me give you an example about something. We all know about salvation. Does everyone, is everyone, you can, you're born again, you love God, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Raise your hand. You, you are saved. You know you're saved. That trumpet sounds like the song earlier or something happens. You are, in, you are with Jesus Christ, right? No questions, right? That salvation experience. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16, right? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So who is salvation available to? Whosoever, right? Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is everyone born again in the world? Is everyone in South Carolina saved? It's a pretty Christian state, right? How about Greenville or Anderson County? Everyone born again or saved? How about Pelzer? West Pelzer? Not big, not, not big towns. Everyone saved, born again? Why is that? Because not everyone has heard. And in and, and a lot of cases, some people have heard, but they've never made that decision, right? We have to know the word of God. We have to know the promises of God. My point is you have to hear these things to know that they're even true. You have to hear these things. I, I heard there were some great messages this morning in Sunday school talking about the Holy Spirit. If you don't hear about the Holy Spirit, do you know about the Holy Spirit? No. There's a lot of people who got saved when they were younger and, all, and they went to church one time, they got saved, they never went back and all they ever heard was Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and he's your savior. That is, and that is the single most important decision anyone can ever make in the history of decisions, right? Because it affects your eternity. But there are so many other things in this Bible, in, this, in the Word of God that can help us live a life, not just live a life and get by and hope, one, and just one day we're going to be in heaven. Everything's going to be okay. I'm going to be in heaven. All this world and all this, this evil in the world will be out of my life. No, listen, we just read that you are an overcomer. Overcomer doesn't mean it, you, you are of God little children and have just got by because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He said, no, you have overcome because of the greater one on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us when we're born again. Listen, whatever the world throws at you because of the very presence of God living on the inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit, right? You are an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. We can all overcome and live a life not just getting by, right? Not just trying to get to the weekends, or not just trying to get to Sunday, or we're just trying to get to the end of the year, we're trying to get through winter, we want to get to summer. No, no, we can overcome right now. Remember I said earlier, if God is for you, who can be against you? We are overcomers, and we can be overcomers. So if you've heard this this morning, I want you to know, you've now heard, we've read in the Word of God you now have no excuse to just get by. We can now overcome, but we don't have to. This is the best part. We don't have to do it under our own effort. I don't have to work harder to be a better Christian. I don't have to walk more in love and try really hard, right? For it is God who works in you. We, thank God. If we, listen, if we could do this on our own, would we have even needed the Holy Spirit? If we could be good enough to be God's children, wouldn't the Israelite, Israelites probably have pulled it off? They, they probably saw a lot more miracles than I've ever seen. The Red Sea parted. I'd like to believe that would have been mostly enough for me. But, but sweet bread fall, falling from heaven every morning? I mean, I like donuts. I don't, I'm guessing it tasted better than donuts. I, I'm pretty sure, I'd love to believe, listen, more than likely I'd be a lot, lot like the Israelites and start complaining after a while, but... I'm going to pretend since I don't have to back it up. I would be the one who would believe God just for those miracles, right? But it's so encouraging to know that His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He, the greater one, He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's with us. He's for us, and He's in us. And that should excite you this morning. Amen. You and I, listen, we are not facing this life alone. We don't go through this life. We're not trying to fulfill 
what we read in God's word, what we learn in church, what, what God wants us to do, you know, whatever it may be, a call of God in our lives. We're not trying to do it in our own efforts and in our own strength. Because let's just be honest, none of us could do it if we had to rely on our own strength and efforts. Every one of us fail whenever we try to do everything in our own efforts and strength. I know I do. I, I fail. The Holy Spirit is working in us to will or to want to and to actually do for His good pleasure. And not only are we not in this alone, but when we, were learned to, we learned to rely on the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit on the inside of us, the greater one who lives on the inside of you and lives on the inside of me, you and I are overcomers through him as well. Amen. Now listen, I, I don't, most of y'all I don't, I don't know in here. I, a lot of y'all I recognize, but I don't know most of y'all in here. A few of y'all I'm, I'm related to, obviously, right? But I talked about salvation, you know. I talked about, you know, loving God and being a child of God and accepting Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10, you don't have to turn there. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, right, the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How do we obtain salvation, right? How do we, how do we come to the place where God's Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us? How do we get to that place? Um, well, you know, like we've talked about this morning, but we just read it. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Being a good person, doing good deeds, doing good things for other people, being, you know, other people calling you a good person. Coming to this church every single day for your entire life, as long as it's been around, although these are all wonderful things, not one of them makes you right with God. Not one of them saves you. They're good things. We should be doing them. But those aren't, that's not what makes you born again. Only confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead does it. Now I'm going to say this. If you aren't 100% sure this morning, if you've ever actually received Jesus, if, you, if you aren't 100% sure that if something happened, God forbid, and you went out and something happened and you died today, that you wouldn't be right in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can leave here knowing that you are right with God 100%. You can leave here knowing that you are born again and that the Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. Or, listen, you might be here this morning and you, you haven't been right with God. And that's an easy one to, to happen to, to, for us to slip, right? It's an easy one. You know what it's like to walk with God and you know that you're not right now and you want to get right with God. Listen, if everyone would bow their heads and, and close their eyes for one second. If any of those are you this morning, if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you aren't sure you've ever received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you want to get your life right, and you want to be back to being 100% right with God, don't leave here this morning without knowing this. I want you to raise your hand. Don't leave here this morning without knowing you're right with God.